You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. I know it's been a while. I apologize. We're going to fix that. Um, I've been busy and so life happened and got in the way. And actually, I made this podcast yesterday or the day before. And when I went to review it, there was a sound quality issue that was just bothering me too much to publish it. So I said, no, I've got to do it again. So uh, it takes, you know, I don't know how long this podcast will end up being 20 or 30 minutes, whatever it is, but it takes me a lot longer to produce that 20 or 30 minutes of material. So anyway, now it should be rehearsed. It should be better. Maybe the second time I'll have some new epiphanies to share with you. Before I get on to today's episode, I just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. Let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, overeating. Um, so BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anybody on camera if you don't want to, which I can definitely relate to. There's times when I've told you guys the hotel rooms. I'll say about that again in a minute. Um, Anyway, it's more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast, being sponsored by BetterHelp, gives you a 10% discount off your first month. Go to betterhelp.com slash anxiety podcast. That's betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash anxiety podcast. Right, there you go. Yeah, the old hotel room story. Um, So I went to Vegas once. I've been to Vegas a few times. Um... But on one of the occasions in my old life, in my old world, I had to dial back in for the weekly sales call. And uh, it wasn't because my sales numbers were bad or the fact that I was worried about sharing them. It's just that I was at a anxiety point in my life where I just felt, you know, that um, that particular meeting just had a lot of trauma associated with it for me because I would always have to squirm my way through it. Not that anything ever bad happened there. It was just, you know, one of those things where people, place, uh, subject matter would just trigger me and I would sit through these meetings in a boardroom, scribbling notes to myself on my notepad and just trying to get through the moment without screaming and running out of the room, which I did once. But anyway, on this one occasion, I went into the bathroom in a hotel room in Vegas because I think uh, my wife was with me. So she's asleep. I go into the bathroom to do this conference call and uh, they went around the table asking for updates and it got to my point and I couldn't talk. I couldn't get any words out. I was just like, uh, and I was kind of stood there thinking, this is odd because I'm not even in the same room. They can't see me. And anyway, I just hung up, put the phone down after a few minutes of struggling, not a few minutes, a few seconds of struggle. I just hung up. And then I sent an email to my boss saying there's something wrong with my phone or the phone signal's bad or the conference call cut me off or some excuse so that I wouldn't have to participate. And I said, here's an email digest of my uh, my numbers for you. So escape to that one. But the problem is with anxiety is when you escape it and you successfully evade it, you start to sort of develop behavioral habits that will... Uh, potentially help you avoid it again in the future which is which is not good because then uh then yeah then you start to become a recluse right you don't go out you don't speak to people and and it and it builds on itself so um one of the kind of learnings for me going through uh, the the world of anxiety was that at some point you got to start leaning into it at some point you have to do things when they're uncomfortable and this is a very good you know uh topic to talk about in all facets of our life right whether it's um sticking to a diet food wise or um exercising exercising is is just a always a beautiful example because it's always very uncomfortable are often very uncomfortable. Um, but when you finish, you feel great. And long-term, you feel great. Long-term, you feel way better because you live longer, right? Probably. And healthier and more flexible and stronger, and etc. I was listening to an interview with uh, uh, a good 
podcast episode with a guy called Edward O'Thorpe. It was on the Tim Ferriss show uh, recently, and he was uh, he's just a fascinating. If you're interested in finances, um, which I'm going to talk a bit about today, or health or longevity or just great points of view, he, he's an 89-year-old who can still do a pull-up, a couple of pull-ups. Couple, I think he said he can do two or three chin-ups and one or two reverse grip, like proper pull-ups, which at 89, he's like, yeah, a decade ago, I could do a dozen of each of those. And it's just, I mean, that's outstanding. And one thing he realized in his life was that um, to make health a priority and to invest in in fitness, uh, you know, whatever age you are, it's never too late to start as it relates to health. It just isn't. But the younger you can start, the more you can benefit from those um from those gains that you make if you start working out in your 20 and maintain it you're going to have great great gains and uh i've I came across a study recently which talked about um i don't know who wrote it so i can't quote anybody unfortunately but it was talking about the link between mus uh m- muscle mass and longevity so it kind of makes sense if you think about the longer in your life you can retain lean lean body mass lean muscle mass um the longer you're going to live because it gets to practical things like can you get out of bed can you stand up can you get off the toilet um all those sorts of things so again it's not just about flexing in the gym it's about functional tasks that we can do easily today can you get up off the floor when you're 80 easily because you've been working on those triceps working on those quads got to stay strong, right? So there's some interesting things to think about. Why I've been uh, AWOL for a month is is uh, a couple of fold. And it, I have to say, like, it bothers me. I think about the podcast uh, every day, pretty much, or at least multiple times a week where I'm like, gosh, got to get one out. Uh, and I go through phases, as you know, of being very uh, regimented about, you know, weekly or whatever the, the cadence is of producing material. But um, I moved house and uh, the process was very disruptive just because moving house is and I'm a realtor, so I should know this, but it, you know, when it's actually you packing boxes and moving stuff and prepping and getting the new house ready and moving stuff into it and setting up, it just took a lot longer than I thought. So I apologize for being gone for a bit and uh, you know, it's great that people continue to listen to the podcast so much. It doesn't just drop off to zero, but people keep downloading and listening, which is great. And I, obviously at this point with hundreds of episodes to listen to, there's still lots of relevant content out there for you to engage in. And um, whenever I have like a little mini pause like this and come back, I think, do I still have anything to say? Is it still relevant? And does anybody care? And those types of imposter syndrome type thoughts. And I have a little look at the anxiety podcasts that exist uh, in terms of other anxiety podcasts. And I still feel like I have a different angle on this stuff and, and something else to say. So you still, you're stuck with me. I'm afraid I keep putting this stuff out and try and be more consistent about it because I am a, you know, I'm a big podcast listener and there's probably a handful, five podcasts I listen to all the time. And if I go there and they haven't released a new one, I'm upset. I'm like, oh no, no, check again the next day. And, but I can imagine after a while you stop checking, right? So this is not good for my numbers if I don't produce content regularly. So I realize that, um, but sometimes life gets in the way and you got to take care of that stuff first. Now, today's episode, I wanted to talk a bit about um, a few things. I mean, it's it's kind of financial, but it's also about life and about the time you put into things and about, um, you know, yeah, just sort of what you do for work, what you do for to, to raise money for your family and your food and all that kind of stuff, how you put money on the table. Um, sorry about that, just adjusting my seat. Um, but yes, this has been a big thing that's made me stop and think. And particularly when I reflect on my old life of corporate, um, the corporate world where I'd be sat in a cubicle or traveling and, and, you know, trying to believe in products I was selling and, 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 and trying to ultimately in a lot of cases, just wish the time away so I could go home again. Um, and just getting through the day. We've all probably... Uh, no doubt if you're listening to this, you can resonate with having a job where you're just like, God, is it five o'clock yet? Or whatever the time your shift ends. And you just want it to be over. You just want it to be end so you can go home. Literally wasting your life um, because you need the money because you have to go to work. So anyway, I came across this book, which was recommended in a in a group I'm in, I think, called Your Money or Your Life. 
Um, and uh, it's a great book. It's by uh, a lady called Vicky Robin and um, also Joe Dominguez. And they talk about the principles of, I mean, ultimately, they they kind of started a movement or were part of a movement called FIRE. Now, FIRE stands for Financially Independent Retire Early. So, um, and now people talk about FI, which is just financially independent, doesn't mean you're going to retire, but you essentially, at a very fundamental level, it means that you generate enough money from your investments to cover your expenses. That's the definition of financial independence. You're not relying on a company or a job or a salary or anything to sustain you. You have your own self-sustaining income. Now, that could be generated a variety of different ways. It could be through owning rental property. It could be uh, through owning um, stocks that pay a dividend. It could be through... um, you know, having created a jingle that pays you a royalty every time they play it on the radio um, or some kind of licensing arrangement. Or anyway, just ultimately something that is doesn't require um, or isn't beholden to somebody else's whim or decision or anything else. It's effectively, you know, income coming in, um, probably uh, passive being the the ultimate goal. So you don't have to do anything to get it. You just wake up and money comes in. Kind of cool, right? Now, I've owned lots of residential real estate and uh, rented out before, and some people class that as passive income. Some people say, ain't passive if you have a problematic uh, person living in your house and you have to deal with that. So there are times when things aren't passive. They are active. Uh, But on the whole, that's still a great way, historically has been a great way to generate wealth by owning real estate. As they say in real estate, you make money three ways. Um... You get rent, and hopefully, um, if you do it properly, you get positive cash flow. So you get meaning that the the, the rent income is more than the expenses on the house. Um, you also get appreciation in the market. So the the housing market has tended to appreciate over time. Some years, like the recent couple, has gone up a lot quicker. Other decades are flat, and but over time, if you look at from you know the last hundred years, it goes up and to the right, much like the stock market. Um, and then the third way is paying down the mortgage. So a bit of cash flow, bit of appreciation and pay down the mortgage. You can make money three ways if you buy right. And you have to, when you're in real estate terms, selling is important in terms of what you get for the sale of the house. But as many people say, you make money when you buy a house because you got to buy at the right price, um, and put the right tenants in it and do it properly. Anyway, I got loads of success stories, loads of failure stories in that realm, um, but that's one of the ways of doing it. But anyway, that kind of going around the houses a little bit there, no pun intended. Um, but that's kind of the definition of financial independence is it's very simple, right? You've got more money coming in than your expenses are. Now, you can you can do that with a job, obviously, but you're not financially independent because you're, you're required to work at the job. Um, and so that's you know, you can you can just say, well, I'm not going in today or this week or this month because I just want to take it easy. You can't do that with a job because they'll fire you and then you don't cover your expenses anymore. So the kind of f- the flow of this book talks about, you know, understanding what your expenses are, writing them all down, understanding what your income is. And, and first of all, that's the first kind of crosshair that you want to or the, the first line that you want to breach is you got to make sure your income is more than your current expenses. Otherwise, you are losing money every month or going into further debt every month. Um, and then in the background, kind of the third line on a graph, so one being income, one being expenses, the third line on the graph would be your investments, passive income, other sorts of income that you're gradually building over time so that one day in the future, uh, and that could be a short you know, five-year horizon or a 25-year horizon, depending on where you're at, how old you are, how much money you got, the income from the passive investments crosses over the expenses, and that's when you reach what they call FI, financial independence. Then you can decide if you want to retire early, travel the world, or carry on working because you love it, right? And uh, I'm fortunate in my situation that I've been through um, iterations of my life where um, I've hated my job, quite frankly, and now I love what I do, and it, it does already allow me 
a lot of flexibility because I get to work from home and I work with people that are really nice um, and I work in real estate. So it's kind of a culmination of things that I love, right? I've always been interested in sales and negotiation. Um, I've always been interested in real estate, um, both as an investment tool, but just also like, wow, this house is really cool and look at all the rooms and the view and stuff like that. Um, and I love helping people. And so pulling those things together allows me to help people look at houses, sell things, make an income. It's all good. It brings all my skill set together. I really enjoy it. So I've I've had to, as you know, if you've been listening to this for a while, I've had to make some reasonably extreme changes in my life to end up where I am now. But I challenge you to do the same um, if they are appropriate, right? So if you're in a job that you don't like, how do you make a change? Probably a great time now to change careers because there's a lot of people hiring. There's a lot of availability workforce wise for you to make a change and do something different. Um, but I'll talk a bit more about this book because there's some, one of the massive epiphanies in it for me, probably the biggest takeaway was, was, uh, something they call, um, life energy. So I'm going to talk a bit about life energy because I think it ties it together. And, and, uh, so it's not just about money, but money is something that, all of us need to sustain our lives, right? Either you already have enough money and it's fine, or like most of us, you don't, and you're still trying to get more so that you can pay the bills and 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 have that retirement option in the future. Um, so some of the early questions in the book are, do you have enough money? Uh, are you spending enough time with your family and friends? Do you come home from your job full of life? Uh, do you participate in things you think are worthwhile? If you are laid up laid off from your job, fired, etc. Would you see this as an opportunity? Are you at peace with money? Does your job reflect your values? Are you ethically aligned to it? Um, so many of these historically I would have struggled with. Now I feel much closer to lots of them. Uh, they also say, do you have enough savings to see you through six months of normal living expenses? You see lots of things in the news and media talking about how lots of people live month to month or paycheck to paycheck, meaning if you lost your job, you struggle to pay the bills the following month. So it was stressful to be in that situation. Um, the book, and also just so you know, um, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes, um, the book is called Your Money or Your Life. If you go to yourmoneyoryourlife.com forward slash book dash summary, there is, uh, or just go to yourlifeyourmoney.com, you'll see a link for uh, book summary on there under resources, I believe. Um, yeah, and you can follow along. You, that's the Coles Notes, if you will. Um, so really, it's, 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 this book's about understanding the basics of money um, and and really understanding kind of how it works for you at the moment and how you can possibly get it to work better. Um, and the first step for me was I, I literally sat down and wrote down all my expenses and I looked at that versus how much income I've got now and how much I've got from, you know, in my investments and those types of things. So it's just really getting an understanding of where you are day one. And then, you know, you need to know where you are now to be able to move forward in the future. In the past, I've definitely been guilty of like throwing stuff on the credit card and trying to pay the credit card off. And oh dear, I got charged a couple hundred dollars in fees for that. Well, not too bad. At least I carried on buying everything I wanted. It doesn't, work and, and multiple times in my life the credit card has added up to an amount where it's uh it's become insurmountable so i've then had to go and take out a loan the credit card's built up to 10 grand you gotta go and take out a credit line to pay off the credit card it's just interest on interest it's no fun because i was spending more than i made that's the fundamentals of this is if you spend more money than you have coming in and you don't know what you're spending or how much you're really making properly then uh, you're going to fail. So those are the ones that we need to sort of figure out at the outset. Um, one of the first things that gets you to do is uh, find out how much you've earned in your lifetime, which is kind of kind of interesting. So it wants you to add up all your paychecks from all of history. And to be honest, I didn't do this bit because I'd have to go back to UK pounds and do conversions and I can't find that information. So I didn't do that. Um, but the reason for doing that is it wants you to look at how much you've earned and then what do you have to show for it. So you're kind of creating this personal balance sheet, um, you know, give a current value, market value of everything you own, assets, liabilities. You're trying to figure out where you stand. They make a big point of saying there's no shame and no blame. You're not trying to like beat yourself up for money you spent on a handbag. That's over. You already got it. But what you can do is set a new standard for moving forward. 
money is something we choose to trade our life energy for. So this was the bit that that really struck me um, was to establish, and again, it's a tool on the website. I told you your money, your life.com where you can calculate the actual cost you make per hour, your real hourly wage. It includes taking tax off. It includes meals and clothes you have to wear for work and travel and commuting and all that sort of stuff. And so what it makes you do is every time you're going to go and buy a cup of coffee or buy lunch or something, you can, instead of saying that's $5 or $50, it's like, that's, you know, 15 minutes of my life or two hours of my life to buy, buy this. And obviously, as you make bigger purchases, more more time of your life. So it's keeping an understanding of that. And then the kind of the whammy that comes with that is if you look at how much time you have left in your life, and there's an illustration of this in the book. So I'm not 45 yet, but that'll be my next birthday. And he just turned 44. You're so you know, old to live for. Everything's fine. But anyway, in the example in the book, it says, I'm, I'm using rough numbers now, so don't quote me. But basically, if you're about 45, you have about 350,000 hours left to live in your life. 350,000 hours left. You die when you're 81 on average. Now, if you minus sleeping out of that, which is probably about a third of your life, um, then and then deduct off basic things like brushing your teeth and going to the toilet and feeding yourself, you're left with a discretionary 108, uh, sorry, 178,000 hours. 178,000 hours is the time you got left to choose what you will do with that. Now, that could be working, that could be surfing, it could be walking your dog, working out, spending time with the one you love, whatever. But for many people, it's going to be a lot of working, right? So then you look at like, we've got 178,000 hours left because I'm 45. Um, and I'm going to spend like eight hours a day out of that at work. And you can do the numbers. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's pretty desperate if you're doing something you don't like or you're not making as much money as you're worth, for instance, uh, or you're suffering ethically or geographically or some other way based on the job you have. So again, why this book was so interesting is, yeah, part of it's about the brass tax of investing and making sure you know what your expenses are, making sure you know what your income is and, and trying to get to that financial independence piece. But it's also about how you get there and what you do and realizing that every hour of your life, you're choosing where to allocate it. You, you are either consciously or subconsciously placing it in a certain area. And if you work eight to 10 hours a day, 50 hours a week, 200 hours a month, 2,400 hours a year in a job you don't like, then you can see that add up pretty quick. And it's not something you should be doing. So those, that, those life energies that are being spent need to be spent in, in an appropriate way. So that's kind of like the core of what the, the the book is about. Like, how are you spending your life energy? What do you do with your time? Um, it also talks about enoughness, like how much is enough? Um, and I was, another story I heard recently with regards to this was, I think it's Kurt Vonnegut. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name properly, but he famously had a conversation with somebody, this author who wrote a book and they were at a party at a billionaire on shelter shelter island at a billionaire's house and kurt vonnegut said to this guy you know the host of the party probably made more money yesterday than your book will make in its whole lifetime of of royalties and the the other chap whose name escapes me turned around to him and said yes but i have one thing they will never have enough right so another practical thing about this conversation is like what is your why how much is enough for you how much and that is you know how much money do you need to sustain the life you want to have now or in the future um where do you want to live what do you want to do how do you, how do you spend your time if you could take a step back with a blank piece of paper and sit down and say right tim this is my perfect day what does that entail for you have you done that exercise you know is your perfect day waking up and having a nice cup of coffee or tea and sitting on the balcony and watching the sun come up and then reading for an hour and then working out? Um, or is it, you know, going uh, going to work on a passion project you have or or going traveling around the world? It, it's, it's a totally individual question. And um, it's ironic that I've re-recorded this because there was some... Uh, 
noise interruptions. There's somebody like just down the road who's fired up a, a, a grinder or a welder of some sort now. So hopefully you can't hear that. Um, I'm very, very uh, highly attuned to background noise when I'm making podcasts. Um, one of the things I haven't done yet, but I'm going to do this week is to create a wall chart. So you create this wall chart, plotting your total monthly income, your total monthly expenses, and your, your income generated from investments, wherever that may be. So you can start to see where those things are. And definitely much like, uh, you know, one of those big thermometers outside a school or a church, when you're raising money for a target, if you see something every day, it's going to pull you in the right direction or make you consciously aware of it. I have it for my job, for my real estate sales. I have a list of all the houses I'm working on on the big board in my office because not only is it important to see the houses I'm working on, but I want to see the gaps because those gaps need to be filled with new opportunities, right? So if you're looking at your expenses and the expense line's going up and the income line's flat or whatever that happens to be, you're going to become more aware of like, hang on a minute, something is wrong. Either my expenses are too high or my income's too low I haven't put any money in my investments. You need to be aware of it. You need to do this stuff. It's super important for your future. And again, it doesn't matter how old you are. It's, you know, I know people who are in there at their retirement age who are figuring this out. And, this, you know, the sooner you can get in front of it, obviously with uh, the uh, the beauty of compounding, you're going to get much further ahead. All right? All right. <clears throat> oh, here's this thing on here I was talking about. So, uh, yeah, it says 45... Uh, at 45 years old, you have 33 average age and life expectancy. So you have 33 years left, which is 289,000 hours left. Um, <clears throat> so, and then it gives you like a checklist before you spend, you know, for step one, don't shop. Two, live within your means. Take care of what you have, wear it out, do it yourself, anticipate your needs, research value, quality, durability, and multiple use get it for less, buy used, etc. Um, we're advertised to so much, both, you know, traditional TV, um, they're even talking about putting adverts on Netflix now because the company's not doing very well and they want to give a cheaper option. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but if you're on social media, you're getting adver- advertised to a ton. If you're watching traditional news, you're getting advertised to a lot. So, and, and and gone are the days where we'd have to like take cash to a shop and buy something. Now you just think about it. You come up with something in your imagination. You're like, oh my God, imagine if I could get that particular widget to help dry the dishes more quickly. And you go onto Amazon and they somebody already invented it. It's for sale. You can have it tomorrow. You're like, yes, that's terrible for us. As convenient as that is, it's terrible for us and terrible for your bank account. We've got to start solving more of our own problems and, and not looking for that quick fix because quick fixes in financial terms and health terms and all the rest of it don't work and they're not sustainable and they're not long term. Um, it then goes into a bit in, in the final step of this process, it goes into a bit about you know what you can do with capital you save to produce income, to make it safe, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a whole different... I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not going to start telling you where to put your money, but um, there's there's large, you know, um, there's bits of advice in this book and lots of other books which will talk about income producing um, investments you can make that are very safe. Um, so that's kind of really what that whole topic was about. Ultimately, um, I think in summary for me, was it's really about um, starting off with uh, understanding a financial picture of where you're at today. How much money do you spend? How much money do you bring in? We need to know that. We should all know that. I've got an, I downloaded an app. Um, I think it's just called Spend. I don't remember. Um, downloaded an app on my iPhone. So now once a week I go in there, I plug in into all my categories. I sat down with Steph, my wife. We did an expense budget, sat down all the categories, I plug all the numbers in. It doesn't sound fun, but it's definitely empowering to know how much you've got and how much you're spending in different areas. Because guess what? If you don't know how much you're spending, you'll never be able to reconcile that. You'll just be like, well, seems I just checked the credit card bill. I haven't checked it online for a couple of weeks and there's five grand on there. Where did that come from? This is ridiculous. I didn't spend that much money. And then you go back and you're like, oh yeah, I went to Lululemon and uh, went out for lunch a few times and booked that flight. And before you know it, it, it adds up. It's fantastically fast. And if you end up paying 19.99% interest on that money, it will add up even faster. So first off, understand where you're at. Secondly, um, understand um, 
if you are investing for the future, which I recommend everybody should do, however small it is, is invest in some capital, putting some money away so that you can start to benefit from the wonders of compound interest. Okay. Um, this is good stuff. If you're 20 years old and listening to this, hallelujah, you have lots of time and you should start now. Um, and I'll be teaching my, I've already talked to my kids about this, but as they start producing an income, I think definitely getting into the habit of saving some, um, is very important. And, uh, it builds that habit of saying, right, I've got money for food. I've got money for rent or whatever else. And I'm putting away 10% for future me to take care of that. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that makes a massive difference to your investing horizon is time because time helps it all grow. Right. So, um, that's kind of like the financial component. And then the non-financial component is ultimately, what do you do with your time? Uh, if you think about those um, hours of your life and, and look at that graph on the website there of like how many hours you have left in your life, it's a sobering fact to think that you only have a certain amount of time on the planet. What are you doing with it? You know, it's kind of like going back to the, I always think of the Fight Club film, um, what you own owns you, right? One of my favorite lines. Um, but also the, the, the recognition that your life is ending one minute at a time or one second at a time or whatever he says, like it's morbid and, and all the rest of it, but being intentional about what you do is so important, not suffering like bad relationships with people you don't like or jobs you hate or places you don't like living in. You can change all of these things. Some of them are very hard. Some of them might be your significant other or family members, obviously very difficult, very extreme in that case. Um, but some of them might just be people that you tolerate because, oh, well, you know, I should probably talk to them because no, you don't have to. And, um, you have to kind of, uh, preserve your own sanity, the self-preservation piece before you start um, trying to save other people. Put your own oxygen mask on first. Take care of you because a healthy, functional you is going to be much in a much better position. I mean, even if you talk about finances, health, I know you said healthy, wealthy. I will say it, healthy, wealthy, because if you have taken care of the finances and you need to help somebody out in the future, you're going to be in a much better position to help them, your children, your friends, somebody who needs something. If you've done the work and 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 taking the time to to learn about that and educate yourself um is so important um so anyway that's kind of what i wanted to get into today your money or your life the book review uh no well yeah it kind of is right it's here's something i read i think it's uh very um significant uh it's definitely on my mind at the moment in terms of just kind of uh understanding where everything's at um understanding what that perfect day looks like for you and what would it take to get to that perfect day? Could you do it now? A lot of people could do it already. They just don't do it because they, they, they're not in the habit of doing it. But moving your life towards your ideal day, one step at a time and uh, understanding what that would look like. Um, and for some people, you know I, know, I know lots of people through this kind of research that I do who have reach their financial independence much quicker because they moved to Mexico or they moved to Panama or Costa Rica or somewhere. They've arbitraged the cost of living from a, a, an expensive, more expensive country like America or Canada or England or Australia. And they've moved to places which are much cheaper. And they, you know, they said, right, now's the time to hit the button and move, right? You remember the story I told you about the old German sailor that I met on a small island in the... Uh, close to where I live in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, this gentleman had sold all his worldly belongings and bought a boat. And that's kind of all he had. I don't think he had like passive income stream coming in. He just sold his stuff and maybe he had like 50 grand or something and bought an old boat and did it up. And and uh, I just said, how do you, he said, it's funny because all the time people ask him, how do you do it? Oh, you live in a dream life. You just live on your boat and sail around the you know, the South Pacific and up here to Canada and down to the States and Mexico and Hawaii. How do you do it? It's amazing. He said, well, I just did it. It's not that hard. It's just the, the ability to, or the, uh, the, the braveness, the courage to let go of all your material possessions and sell everything in his case, um, was extreme. And I couldn't do it because I need a house and I, I have three kids at the moment and, and I got other responsibilities, but as a single older German man, that's what he did. He sold all his stuff bought a boat, sailed it around. He said, when I run out of money, I just port, go into like a local dock and I ask for a job and I work on boats, cleaning them up and fixing engines. And they give me a place to grab some food and save up enough money. And I go and do another trip. And people were like overthinking it, thinking, oh, you must've done some, 
you know, crazy 15 step investment plan to generate enough money to, he's like, no, I just, I just left it all behind. And I'm sure some days he wishes he had somewhere to go. That's not rocking around. Um, but he's created the freedom himself in an instant and it wasn't expensive. It was just very brave. Uh, he also is the man who famously came up with the line, um, with regard to his, uh, his liberation, he, his quote is, I don't make any plans and I'm sticking to them. That was his, that was his tagline, which I think is great. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed today's, uh, podcast update, etc. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please share this with somebody you care about and leave a review on Apple or Spotify. You can do a little five-star review or something on there. Uh, and remember until next time, Less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.